cookies I need to just make, I failed to mention, it was brought to my attention. I'll be fired, don't let them ask you to do this again. But we have a world speaking, whoa, we have a world speaking champion right in our midst. And I should have acknowledged him, but he is so humble, he has forgiven me. <laughs> Press, please stand. You are forgiven, Madam Coach. <laughs> I will sleep easy knowing that. I will. Thank you so much. It's also mentioned to me, just in case I forget, when we leave this evening, we need to exit out on the Franklin side, not the side you came in. That side is locked. So, we need any assistance in that. Okay, are we ready now for a little laughter? Yes. yes. We're about to conduct a humorous speech contest. If you happen to use your cell phones during that time, please silence them. Once the contest has begun, we'll have the Sergeant Vaughn secure the doors. Nobody will go, will go in and out while the contestants are speaking. And as mentioned, you will not leave the room till all the ballots are collected toward the end. Let me give you the speaking order. First speaker, Adrian Turner. Adrian Turner. Second speaker, Ava Tony Snyder. Third speaker, Yang Mani. Our fourth speaker, John McAndrews. John McAndrews. Our fifth speaker, Kenneth Holt, Kenneth Holt, and our last speaker will be Mandy Shaw, Mandy Shaw. Our timer's ready. Contestant number one. Adrian Turner, the life of a Turner, the life of a Turner, Adrian Turner. Good evening to my fellow distinguished Toastmasters and our esteemed guests. The title of my speech is The Life of a Turner. Now, I'm not necessarily funny, but the life of a Turner is hilarious. <laughs> when you think about funny, nothing's more funnier than childhood and family. And so I want to share some of my stories of what I experienced when I was growing up. And the names of the innocent have not been changed because they are clearly guilty. <laughs> So, you know how moms are in the morning? We gotta go. We gotta get the kids together. I gotta go. I gotta be on time for work. So, this morning, my mom calls my brother, Ryan, you have not brushed your teeth and it's time to go. Get in here so I can brush your teeth. So she puts what she thinks is toothpaste on his toothbrush. She's brushing his teeth. You hear him go, Huh. She said, boy, be quiet, we gotta hurry up and go. So she brushes again. Uh, uh, boy, what is wrong with you? It, it hot. It, it's hot. It's hot. It turns out she is brushing his teeth with icy hot. <laughs> now, don't worry, don't worry, he's a well-adjusted adult. And she was clearly mortified. But these are the things that I experienced. Or, this is my brother. My other brother, Marty. Now, whenever anything happened traumatic to Marty, he wanted to repeat every piece of information he ever knew because he thought he was going to lose it. So, this 
particular time. You know how kids are. We love to ride bikes and riding up curves and just acting like a daredevil. And he hits a brick wall about this high. He hits it right off the back of that bike. Hits his head. Bow. He gets up. He goes. My name is William Turner. I live at 25 in the 86th place. Oh my God. Oh my God. And so. It, it was just, it was funny the way that he always repeated information because it always hit his head. He has hit quite often. He should have probably repeated his information anyway. <laughs> and then there was this time. He, he's very good with following instructions. He's very bad with timing, however. So, my mother says, she pulls up to the house, she says, Now, Marty, when I stop this car, I want you to get out and get the mail out of the mailbox. What he heard was, get out the car and get the mail. I mean, he heard, get the mail. He didn't hear when I stopped this car. He jumps clear out the car while it's moving. Bow. My name is William Turner. I live in 2550 East My phone number is. It was just, it was one of the most hilarious things to watch your brother every time he hit his head say all of his information so that he didn't forget it. And then, you know how people are when they're married. Long time. My grandparents were married 59 years. Beautiful. But they had an argument without ever discussing what they were arguing about. So it went something like this. We're in a car, and they were going to the numerous number of stores like your grandparents do. They get up one day of shopping. Reuben, we forgot to get the, the, the thing. Oh, shoot. I don't want to go get that, what you would call it, the thing in my bottle. They're having a five minute conversation. They never said what they were even arguing about. And to this day, I still don't know what the conversation was that they were supposed to go get because they never went and got it and they never even said it. So it's just amazing to watch them have an argument without ever discussing it. And then my aunt Carl, my grandmother's sister. She was the first GPS locator ever. <laughs> she could find you. It don't matter where. She did not need a cell phone. So one day we went to the store shopping and we had this page. Call an night attorney. Call an night attorney. Could you report to the courtesy counter? And my grandmother's like, for real? That's my aunt. I knew you were here. Look, why are you in the store? Why don't you give me some of this? I'm like, how would she know of all stores that we would be at this one at this exact time when we had been going for hours? You know, she would have found Osama bin Laden if they had sent her out. She would have found him a long time ago. And, and then there's my father. Yeah, men, when you guys get older, you get a little grouchy. Let's all be honest. You get a little grouchy. And so, whenever my father is grouchy and he starts acting that some type of way with me, I say to him, you know, buddy, I'm your only daughter and your oldest child. You clearly need to be nice to me. Because if not, I'm going to let those two boys dress you in your casket in, in brown and green. And we'll see when you wake up out that casket how you feel about it then. So, and then last but not least, um, being in the life of a turn. Who, who's a parent here who's ever taught their child how to drive? Is it not the most nerve-wracking experience you've ever had to teach a child how to drive? My daughter's here. So, we're in the car, and you know how moms are. Oh my God, watch the car. Oh my God, do you see the car? Do you see the curb? Oh my God, you're going to kill us. Oh my God, I'm going to die. And so she goes, Mommy, wait a minute. If she said it that way, I'd really be nervous. She said, Mommy, I hate driving in the car with you. I like driving in the car with Grandma and Granddaddy. I said, now you know the reason why. I said, it's because they're older, they're closer to death, and they've clearly come to terms with this, so they don't react to danger at all. Well, I'm young and vibrant. I have things to live for, so yeah, I'm going to be a little nervous. You're right by the car, for goodness gracious. So it, it's just amazing to be and to experience a day in the life of a Turner, and I hope you enjoy 
my childhood and familyhood as much as I did. Thank you. A minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. A minute of silence. Excuse us for a quick second. Well, we appreciate your patience. There's a brief discussion going on that the situation needs to be resolved. So I appreciate everybody's patience.
Mike? How many of you have heard about the new revitalized education program that's rolling out? Do I see some hands? Okay. Ed Ed educational ambassadors should be coming out talking about the new changes. They sound exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again for your patience. I appreciate it very much. I'll take all you guys out for a drink. <laughs> well, except I don't drink, so I'll think of something. Our second contestant, Ava Turner Snyder, aging, staying in tune, aging, staying in tune, Ava Tony Snyder. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. Everyone has something in which they excel, yes? It can be sports, you can be the hostess with the mostest, trivia, politics, and if you're a David Letterman fan, stupid human tricks. <laughs> I once watched a lady on that show shove two grapes up her nostrils with only her tongue, blow them back out, into her mouth, and eat them. Wow. But that's not what I excel in. That thing for me is music. I'm from a very musical family, and at one point or another, there's always music or some kind of singing going on in the house. As a kid, I remember sitting down in front of the television, and I would just totally ingest all of the commercial jingles and the TV theme songs uh, from shows, variety shows. I even enjoyed watching this show that my mom used to watch called Sing Along with Mitch Miller, where they would invite you to follow along with the lyrics at the bottom of the screen by following the bouncing ball. If you name it, if it had music in it, it had my undivided attention. Well, music became a passion of mine, and uh, I received my undergraduate degree in music, and pretty much everything that I do for fun is music-centered. So you may be asking yourself, what does aging have to do with staying in tune? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Where are my baby boomers in the room? Yeah. All right. Any Gen Xers here? Millennials? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> look at that. Well, the one thing that we all have in common is that we're all aging, we're all getting older. But I hasten to say for the millennials, hmm, uh, for me with my musical background, and I used to create all of these challenges within my head as it related to aging, so when it comes to talking to millennials about aging, you're subject to receive a, a response, sounds something like a melody that Adam Levine would sing that says, I'm on my cell phone downloading ringtones. Aging is not my issue, that's you. <laughs> they don't want to talk about aging. They're having too much fun. But, as I said, it is a passion of mine. And for the Gen Xers and the baby boomers in the room, I think that this topic you can relate to. I recall a recent three-year follow-up visit with my ophthalmologist. Her name is Dr. Tito. She's pretty cool as ophthalmologists go. She and I share the same birthday, and coincidentally, we were born the same birth year. She comes into the... Uh, into the room with her hand extended and welcome as she always does. And she says to me, Ava, so how have you been? And right away, my mind starts spinning out a musical response to the tune of an old Johnny Nash song from back in the day. And it's always very exaggerated in my mind. And it went something like, I can't see clearly now my vision. 
limitations gone. I can see none of the obstacles in my way. And that's just a vision, folks. I mean, what with everything else that's starting to age and go wrong? I couldn't think of another tune that maybe Gen Xers can relate to as they're entering the aging process. And that's to the melody of a Robin Thicke song that says, maybe I'm going deaf, maybe I'm going blind, maybe I'm out of my mind. You know, you can relate if you're myopic and you wear those glasses or contact lenses, you understand what he says when he says, I hate these blurred lines. <laughs> but another age-related issue, how many of you remember that female traffic cop that uh, in this commercial regarding urinary incontinence? She's diligently doing her job, and all of a sudden it hits her. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go right now. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. And she rushes off. Well, now when I see that, and sometimes I do on YouTube, I have a pretty good response to that in a musical kind of way. And it's to the melody of a former Beatle Ringo Starr's tune that says, I get by with a little help from deep pens, with a little help from deep pens. And I don't have to go right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when I reached the age of 50, a few years back, and automatically you start to get that mail from that organization that wants to promote supplemental insurance for people in our age demographic. Well, back then I would just toss it unopened into the trash. But now, as I approach my retirement years and start thinking more about that and the possible loss of medical benefits? Oh, I'm singing a whole new tune, folks. Well, I thought about one thing, and how many of you in the room remember YMCA by the Village People? Anybody remember that song? Very popular. Well, I've got my own melody, and it goes like, hey, 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 it's time to sign up for A-A-R-P. Can't wait to sign up for A-A-R-P. And that's from the retirement village people. <laughs> but, I mean, you can't even escape aging in your sleep. If you have sleep apnea, well, Helen Reddy's got a song for you ladies, if the lady's in the room, and that's I Am Woman. Hear me snore, and volume's too loud to ignore. Well, I can go on with this all evening, ladies and gentlemen. But if I can just remind you of one thing, there is a famous American baseball player by the name of Satchel Paige, and he once said in a quote, age is simply a matter of mind over matter. If you don't mind, Age don't matter. Madam Contest. <laughs>
Our third contestant, Yeni Manin. Take a shot, take a shot, Yeni Manin. Sitting here, minding my own business, a person approached. You should go to this game. It's the Chicago Blackhawks Western Conference Finals. Another person approached. No, you're an adult. And you have bills to pay. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters, guess, have you ever been in an argument with yourself? <laughs> it was a Sunday. I'm sitting here minding my own business, and there are always two people arguing about what I need to do with myself. And guess what? They are myself. <laughs> I have one remedy, one prescription. I walked to the kitchen and I took shots of vodka. <laughs> you see, a shot of vodka turns off the negative side <laughs> of my brain. <laughs> Guess who showed up? <laughs> Tony Robbins. <laughs> you need to pursue your goals. You need to take a shot at life. And you need to go to that game. <laughs> I sat here getting ready to watch a hockey game. I need to take a shot at life. Then I took a shot of vodka. <laughs> I am going to that game. I called my buddy Disco Dave. <laughs> Dave, we're going to the Hawks game. And before you say anything, don't say anything. Because Tony Robbins told me to pursue your dreams. And we're going to the hockey game. By the show of hands, have you ever talked yourself out of anything worthwhile in life? I'm still waiting. <laughs> I talked myself out of it, but I took another shot, <laughs> and now I'm taking a shot of this game that I've been wanting to go for a very long time. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I've been living in Chicago since 1994. The Black Hawks are the only winners here. Yeah. <laughs> and how? been to any games. <laughs> and I waited and waited and waited until that Sunday I took a shot and I said, you know what? I checked StubHub and standing room only is $60 each. I called Dave and we made up our mind that we're going to take a shot at this and we're going. So I went. Standing in line, minding my, own, minding my own business, I have the money in my pocket. <laughs> I see two people arguing, but mama said, mind your own business. <laughs> but I heard some key phrases in life, especially going to a hockey game. I'm not selling one. My son has a little league game to go to. You know what? Forget it. As I'm standing at StubHub, I see a gentleman run to his Range Rover and pulls off. 
I said, you know, stand in the room only, or take a shot at stopping him and seeing what he has. I had 3.7654 seconds to make up my mind. <laughs> and for some reason, I didn't go. I said, okay, you have a Hawks jersey on, but you don't want to be threatened. You want to be nice, and you're a Toastmaster, so you know how to speak. <laughs> I ran over to the Range Rover, and I just... <laughs> Body language, body language. <laughs> he pulls over. I said, um, I saw you arguing over there. Do you have some tickets for sale? <laughs> he said, I have two tickets. They are great seats. They're $225 each. But my son has a Little League game and I need to get rid of them. I'm willing to give it to you for $100 each. I reached in my pocket. I happen to have $200 on me. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought those tickets. That day, when I was going to the game, these tickets were $800 a piece. Not $7.95, <laughs> not $12.99 with shipping and handling. They were $800 a piece. I got to the stadium. I've never sat that low in my life. <laughs> I am down there with the rich people. <laughs> we went to the usher. He took us to our seats. Everyone in that section looked at us. <laughs> That's not Jim. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Hawks scored three goals. And I scored the biggest goal in my life. Speaking up, taking a shot, and showing up. Before you talk yourself out of anything, Take a shot. Then you take a shot at life. Yeah. <laughs> then you take another shot. <laughs> then you achieve something. <laughs> Thank you. A minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. A minute of silence, please. Our next contestant, contestant number four, John McAndrews, Confessions of a Chicago Driver, Confessions of a Chicago Driver, John McAndrews. Your overwhelming likelihood is that in 
majority of you have at some point participated in this completely reprehensible activity. And no, I'm not talking about watching an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. <laughs> what I'm talking about is Chicago's traffic. Now, Chicago's got a lot of good things going for it. We've got the Bulls, we've got the Bean, we've even got Kanye West when Kanye West, West keeps his mouth shut. <laughs> but one of the things that we cannot be proud of is our traffic. Now, like any other terrible thing that you do in life, the more you do something, the better you become at it. And Chicago's traffic is no different. And considering I've been living in the city of Chicago for a number of years now, I feel as though I've become somewhat of a subject matter expert on the topic. And over the years, I've been able to compile quite a list of Chicago's unwritten traffic rules. And trust me, this is quite a list. It's actually longer than the list of Illinois' jailed politicians. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to share with you a few of the items that are on that list. Those items are that there is no such thing as land integrity, that Chicago cars never have the right of way under any circumstance, and that, yes, I can, as a matter of fact, tell when you're from the Chicago suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about land integrity. What is land integrity? Land integrity is the ability for you to stay within your lane of traffic. Now, like a guy who's a five approaching a girl who's clearly a ten at a bar, bro, got to do a better job staying in your lane. <laughs> now, what are some of the reasons that we would leave our lane of traffic? Well, in a recent study conferred by me, myself, and I, Associates, LLC, <laughs> nine out of every ten John McAndrews who were interviewed agree that potholes are a major cause for concern when it comes to leaving your lane of traffic. Now, let's be real about this for a second. If you're going to be driving in the city of Chicago and you come across a pothole, you're going to get out of the way because these things are actually the size of Lake Michigan. And if you fall into one of these potholes, it's going to take seven to ten hours for a crane to arrive to get you up. And you've got to go home and you've got to watch an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians tonight, which according to my speech makes you a terrible person. <laughs> so, so you're, you don't want to have to wait there. So you're going to go out of your lane of traffic and you're going to cut off the guy to the left of you. Why are you going to cut off the guy to the left of you? Well, you're going to cut off the guy to the left of you because he's in a Lamborghini. He probably had it coming his way eventually anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's also talk about the fact that Chicago drivers never have the right of way or in any circumstance over any other mode of transportation, which includes bicyclists as well as pedestrians. Let's first address bicyclists. Bicyclists are technically considered motorized vehicles under law. But however, bicyclists have figured out a magical way to turn themselves into some sort of Frankenstein-esque hybrid between a pedestrian and motorized vehicle. Now, in order to elaborate a little bit further on my point, I'd like to tell you all about what I like to lovingly refer to as a Houdini left-hand turn. What's a Houdini left-hand turn? I will tell you what a Houdini left-hand turn is. A Houdini left-hand turn is when you are in a car, and you're stop stuck at a stoplight, and you're about 10 cars back, then all of a sudden, you see a bicyclist come up between you and the car next to you. And that bicyclist, he goes to the intersection and decides, man, there's a red light. I no longer, I no longer want to be waiting for this red light. I'm going to be a pedestrian. He magically transforms into a pedestrian. He cuts left across the crosswalk. He then goes over the curb that's in front of him and decides, I don't want to wait at the curb anymore, so I'm going to become a motorized vehicle. <laughs> and decides to go left down the lane of traffic, which is the Houdini left-hand turn. Let's be real about this for a second. If I'm in a car and I'm going to try to do that myself, I wouldn't be giving the next Toastmaster speech here. It would be at an arraignment hearing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, bicyclists always have the right of way because of such circumstances over Chicago cars. Now, pedestrians, we understand under law, you always have the right of way. We get that. The only thing that I ask is that you just don't be so smug about it. <laughs> when you're going through an intersection illegally, all I ask is that. You just look up from your Candy Crush saga game for a second. <laughs> Stop checking your Facebook status from Sally Sue. I mean, I know she's really important to you. Just acknowledge that I almost snuffed out your life for a second. And just continue, or pretend it never happened. <laughs> Let's also address the fact that I always know whether or not you're from the Chicago suburbs. How do I know that you're from the Chicago suburbs? Because you guys all have a really annoying habit of being phenomenal drivers. <laughs> well, what do you do? Well, you do things such as go the speed limit and actually turn on your right-hand turn signal and you wait for pedestrians when they're in the crosswalk. And you let, you guys are driving me nuts. <laughs> because of you, I'm unable to get to my destination that whole 30 seconds quicker. <laughs> and in my mind, that means the difference between being a garbage man and a C-suite. <laughs> let me explain something about driving in the city of Chicago. 
Driving in the city of Chicago is like an enormous game of blackjack. When everybody at the table is working together to beat the dealer, everybody wins. But when a drunk 21-year-old adolescent comes up to the table and decides he wants to put a $100 bet on red, everybody loses. So you know what? Suburban drivers, you're the drunk adolescent that comes to the table. Quit killing us for a second. Help us out. Help us win the game, and we'll all be better for it. So hopefully all of you learned a few things about the unwritten traffic rules in the city of Chicago. You learned that there is no such thing as lane integrity. You learned that Chicago cars never have the right of way under any circumstance. And that you learned that suburban drivers, I can always tell who you are no matter what. What I'd like to do, though, is I'd like to invite all of you to come down to the city and create your own list of unwritten traffic rules. The only thing that I'll say, though, is that driving in the city of Chicago is not a game. Well, actually, I take that back. It is a game. <laughs> this game is called Survival of the Fittest, and in this game, all of us play for keeps. Thank you very much. A minute of silence while the judges mark the ballots, please. A minute of silence. Our fifth contestant, Kenneth Holt, human resources, trifecta, sex, politics, and religion. Human resources, trifecta, sex, politics, and religion, Kenneth Holt. Sex part, try not to get a little carried away, just slow down a little bit. <laughs> All right, so let's just get right into it. You might see me doing like this a couple of times, this is like a PowerPoint slide there. That's not there. Yeah. That's part of life. All right, here's what happens. Um, when you mention taboo subjects, in, especially in the office, like sex, politics, and religion, people get a little anxious, they get a little uptight. Some of you guys are not breathing now. Just breathe. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're going to do is we're going to clarify a few things, clear some things up, and we're going to give you some hard data that you can take with you so that when someone mentions the unmentionable, you will be able to relax. And you'll because you actually have the truth and real data to back you up. Now, let's get right into it. Um, yep. There's one thing though. Human Resources gave me this letter right before I came. I was supposed to read it on the way over, but I was a little nervous. I forgot to read it, and I'm going to share with you guys. Uh, Mr. Holt, you may deliver your speech entitled Human Resources Trifecta Sex, Politics, and Religion, as long as you don't use the word sex, politics, religion, or any more specific names of such, or the word quivering. <laughs> you know, I'll deal with these guys later. Let's just get started with this. <laughs> All right, that's, sex is something that birds and bees do. Don't try to visualize that. We have, oh, we don't have pictures. Um, it's something that birds and bees do. Then storks come up, and then wolves, and then bunny rabbits, dogs, and cougars. And it's so many animals, I can't keep track of them all. But let's leave it like, let's look at it this way. Sex is kind of like a zoo 
It's hard to find sometimes. Another thing sex has a lot of, and I have to use my notes because if I miss anything, human resources will be all over me. Um, it has a lot of fruity desserts. There's like cherries, peaches, custard pie. It's like a cornucopia. Write that word, cornucopia. Don't use that word because human resources doesn't like it. It scares me. <laughs> right. Another thing you got to remember with, with the sex is um, the ohms and the moans. You have uh, pheromones, you have chromosomes, and you have metronomes. <laughs> the, I don't know what the genetics of the smell of a metronome is, but just remember to wind it up before you get started. <laughs> Politicians think of sex a lot, especially if it's one of their adversaries that has a problem. It's almost like some kind of cardinal activity would lead to bad legislation. Does that actually make any sense? It's like a headline. Congressman cheats on his wife, taxes go up. That makes no sense. <laughs> That's illogical. Uh, one of the things that I uh, have to realize, it's when you think of politics, you have to do it phonetically. So, Picture, oh, picture. Uh, you have a bird that inlays the sound of another bird over and over again. Polly is right there. Picture it now, you can do that. Um, and then you have ticks, which are blood sucking parasites. <laughs> so now when you think of politics, it's not about donkeys and elephants, it's more about bugs than birds. You have a bunch of squawking that sounds the same all over and over again ad nauseum. And you have blood sucking parasites. That's what politics is all about. And when you see congressmen on the TV over and over again, you see it too much, it makes you want to turn to God. Even if you can't believe in it, whatever. And what I, what I notice about religion um, is, is that if, if you mention religion, human resources gets like that. And how do you talk about religion without treading on someone's feelings? <coughs> what you have to do in that case is you have to rise above. And there's a picture of an eagle right here. A picture of that. You've got to rise above all the hundreds of types of religion and the tens of thousands of subtypes of religion until you reach, until you reach the source, until you reach like a commonality. And that commonality is that religion is kind of like Gang, a street gang. There's another picture of the Teletubbies right now, right there. They have the street symbols and they have the colors, the gang colors on them. Um, with that, I just want you to picture one more thing for me. There is a, there's what you might see as. This picture is this picture this. God is two million light years away turning the lights off in another galaxy. Okay? But at the same time, he realizes exactly what kind of hat you have on, <laughs> if it's the right kind for your religion, if you're wearing it at the right time of day. So hats are real important. Always remember that. Symbols are also very important. A lot of religions, they sound alike. They talk the same things until you put a different symbol on it. You put a star on it or a moon or something, and it becomes, again, very important. So we want to keep the symbols together. We want to realize that um, no matter what your situation is, you'll be able to uh, deal with any unmentionable mentionables, if you will, in an office setting or wherever, because you have this hard data. Even though it may be incomprehensible at the moment, it will come back to you, trust me. Thanks very much. Silence while the judges mark their ballots, please. One minute of silence.
our final contestant, Mandy Shaw, chicken, chicken, Mandy Shaw. Does anyone here like chicken? Good. I'm going to talk to you about chicken today. For centuries, chicken has had some very bad rep. We call cowards chicken. Mock old folks no spring chicken. <laughs> we even shame people for having chicken out. <laughs> My very good friend Drumstick and I can no longer let this type of negativity marinate. <laughs> We've cooked up three arguments grounded in the science of linguistics, anthropology, and the culinary arts to remind you all the many qualities of chicken. And by the end of my speech, I will call you to action to have your chicken and eat it too. <laughs> First, chicken is just so versatile. You can bake chicken, grill chicken, roast chicken, roast chicken, barbecue chicken, poached chicken, stewed chicken, saute chicken, make chicken cordon blue, chicken salad, chicken tender, chicken noodle, chicken soup, en español, Pollo con arroz. <laughs> and if you like it spicy, go for chicken curry. And how about your favorite Chinese food, orange chicken? <laughs> Those crisp bites of chicken smothered in that sweet and tangy sauce just a hint of chili. Yum! <laughs> and how about those crispy and hot fried chicken? You know they're greasy, but you've got to have your chicken. <laughs> and for dessert, you can even make Chicken pot pies. <laughs> <laughs> Linguistically, the word chicken carries so much vocal variety. Describe page 77 of the CC manual. <laughs> chicken and I are going to prove it to you. The word chicken has two syllables. None of the other meats do. <laughs> Beef, one syllable. <laughs> Pork, one syllable. <laughs> and how many syllables does fish have? One. one. Even lamb. <laughs> one syllable. <laughs> Don't you want the meat? on your menu that is powerful yet sexy and affordable your answer is chicken <laughs> chicken also has very serious anthropological implications in the contemporary american society especially in Chicago. As an immigrant, my first culture shock had to do with chicken. <laughs> in many Asian countries, dark meat is favored because it's flavorful and juicy. So imagine my shock when I was shopping at Jewel for the first time and saw that chicken breast cost more than $4 a pound and drumsticks were so cheap that another shopper told me that she was buying them to soak her sunken 
practice juggling. <laughs> <laughs> That was a traumatic moment for me. <laughs> I've been stewing over a question for a long, long time. Is white meat really better than dark meat? <laughs> <laughs> Look at McDonald's since they started advertising their chicken nuggets as all white meat. <laughs> Sale had jumped up by more than 35%. This bloody battle between dark and white meat has been eating away at me. <laughs> so I finally did what any sensible Toastmaster would do. I Googled. <laughs> it turns out that it's mostly advertising. According to the USDA, dark meat and white meat have similar fat and much less calories than any other one-syllable meats. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll even let you in on a little secret. Those white meat hamburger patties that you buy with grill marks on them, here's how they're made. Manufacturers put a lot of water and a lot of dark meat into a high-speed blending process. And they suckle the water and fat out. <laughs> and they reconstruct the meat and put grill marks on them. Voila, white meat looking. <laughs> so it's the same chicken. <laughs> Postmasters, chicken has always been there for you. <laughs> Ask not what chicken can do for you, but what you can do for chicken. Go home tonight and open your fridge. Look beyond one syllable meat <laughs> and reach for chicken because it shouldn't matter if it's dark meat or white meat. Don't be hating. <laughs> Choose chicken, love chicken, and eat more chicken. <laughs>
great evaluations tonight? Yes. Yes. Did you enjoy that target speaker? Yes. Did we hear some funny speeches tonight? Yes. So, since I'm more of a left brainer, I have logically concluded that the majority of you enjoyed the contest. I would like at this time all of our contestants to come up for a brief interview, starting with evaluation contestants. Okay. First of all, let me asking them uh, the club you're with, how long you've been with Toastmasters, then I have a specific question for you. Get nervous. Get very, very nervous. Tim, what club are you with? How long with Toastmasters? Extreme Toastmasters. Forever. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember you about that long. Tim, here's your question. Or it feels that long. I know. <laughs> I heard you give a number of speeches. Share with us one of your most memorable speeches to you. How much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> you only have about a minute. All right. Memorable speech. You know about memorable speeches for me, but the most important thing I learned was about using the you. The most powerful thing you can do in your audience is use the word you. It's the word they're dying to hear. It's the word that Toastmasters rarely use. And it's so important. It's easy to get stuck in your story, to talk about things about yourself. And I know you're fascinating, or you, you think you're fascinating. But really, it's all about the audience. It's all about you. So give the audience a break. And say you every now and then, in the middle of your eye, we, me, and here's what I did in my wonderful summer vacation speech. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for competing. We'll have a certificate for you later. Because you came in, but you do get the Bad gift. Yeah. Right. Stuff. Thank you for Thank you. Steve, what club are you with and how long are you with Toastmasters? I'm with Luke Trustmasters for two years and nine months. Hey. Steve, when you are evaluating a speech, you personally, what one quality do you look for in a speech? I look for the connection between the speaker and the audience, whether they're being true to themselves, true to the material, and making an emotional connection with the audience. Thank you for that. And for competing tonight, we have a certificate for you. Sorry, Tim, just kidding. <laughs> Here you go. And a bag, and thank you for competing in tonight's contest. Thank you. What club you're with and how long? I'm with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois Club One uh, since its inception. And I know there's a lot of my people out here tonight supporting me. Thank you for that. And I do want to point out we've only been around for three years, but we've reached President's Distinguished uh, all three years of inception. So. You have as one of your notable accomplishments seeing others that I, I have helped succeed. What is the, share with us just briefly the, the last person that you've helped succeed in, and how did that begin? Um, let me think. Um, so many. Right? So many. So no. many. <laughs> no, I mean, especially um, within, uh, within our company, uh, I think part of the reason why we are as successful as we are is there's a lot of people who are, are hungry for leadership opportunities out there. Um, and, and the number one thing that I always um, kind of help people out with is telling them, it's like, oh, well, are you tired of sitting at your cube all day in and out doing the same work? And actually kind of reaching out to fellow co-workers and say, you know, how, come, come to Toastmasters and kind of see what it's about and let's, you know, develop some things. And, and it, remarkably, I've seen a lot of my fellow Toastmasters at the company actually go on and do great things, get promoted, 
um, become uh, division governors out here um, when maybe a few years back that they would have been either too shy or never would have stepped up to do it. And so um, having a small hand in, in each of those as well as um, some of my mentees that I have has just been extremely rewarding all the way around. I can't pinpoint one, it's just been a phenomenal experience. Wonderful, thank you for competing in tonight's competition. We have a certificate for you and the gold bag. <laughs> Carolyn had to leave, so let's just give her a clap. And let it be said we forgot anybody. Manesh, tell us what club you're with and for how long. I'm with Premier Toastmasters, previously known as Liberty Mola Toastmasters. I've been with the club for the past three years. We were in Libertyville earlier, since we moved to downtown in the Merchandise Mart now. Uh, we changed the name of the club as Premier Toastmasters now. So I can join the group? Yes. Oh, you thought you would. You don't drive down here, do you? No. John, aren't you glad? <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite quote, I want you to talk about your favorite quote briefly. Arise, awake, and stop. Now till your goal is reached. Why is that your favorite quote? One of the inspiration that I have since my childhood is to never leave anything half done. And that's where this quote comes from. This is from Swami Vivekananda. Uh, he also gave some speeches here in the US long, long back, almost 100 years back. But the thing is, when I start something, I always look for a bigger goal, and I strive to complete it and don't stop in between. Thank you for coming up to the stage to compete tonight. Hopefully, this is another goal you've reached, your certificate of participation, and you too get the gold back. Thank you. Now, Dan, I'm going to have to hug because I almost forgot him. <laughs> Thank you for being forgiving, Dan. Dan, tell us what club you're with and for how long. So I'm with a newly formed club here in the city, and that is Microsoft Midwest Toastmasters. We meet in the Aon Center, and we've been a uh, club since June. <laughs> Dan, you have one of your notable accomplishments is that you went to high school with Cindy Crawford. Now, is there anything that's you know, worthy to sell to the inquirer or the There is. Cindy Crawford and I were very, very close in high school. I'm the thumb on this hand. <laughs> We won't touch that any more than that, but thank you for competing in tonight's contest. Your certificate appreciation. Thank you. Should we give them the gold bag? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, you know the team. Who's next up? The next six. Come on down. AT&T Toastmasters. Um, I might have been with us maybe three months, four months maybe, like three or four months. Well, we appreciate you guys hosting us so much. We appreciate you. Now, when your now when your best selling book goes out, the life of a turner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what chapter should we focus on? Chapter number seven. Because <laughs> it's a lucky number. And that's why I'll be telling you all about myself and the deep, dark secrets that I accomplish in bowling every weekend. <laughs> oh, and I bet you they're deep. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you for competing in tonight's time. Come on up. Come on up here. 
Okay. What club are you with for how long? I'm with Speakers of the House Club, 1273065. All right. Not to be confused with the other Speakers of the House Club. Uh, I've been with them for five years. I'm a charter member, actually. Okay. Now, I have failed the CPA exam seven times. Yeah. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. Because <laughs> I'm still trying. Mm -hmm. What song would you sing for me <laughs> to encourage me to give it another shot? Never gonna give it up. No matter how you fail, it, never gonna give it up. <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> All Thank you. All righty, our next contestant, who's wearing that hockey jersey. <laughs> Ying, how long are you Toastmasters? And what club are you representing? I've been in Toastmasters for five years, and it'll be a lifelong journey for me at Michigan Avenue Toastmasters. Yeah. 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 Well, since we know you like taking shots, and not the type of shots that you ended up at Alcohols Anonymous or anything like that. <laughs> One of your favorite quotes is, life is a, not a shot, but life is a dash. Tell us a little more about that. All right, everyone in here has been to a funeral. You have a date of birth, the year of birth, and the year you died. And there's a little dash right in between. And it's your job to make that little dash as meaningful as possible. Mm -hmm. That's why life is a dash. Yeah. Well, thank you for a dashing speech. And we have this <laughs> participation certificate for you. And the gold bag. Thank you. <laughs> Tell us what club you're with and for how long? I'm with AM Center Toastmasters too. <laughs> Father in the house, thank you. <laughs> and I've been with Toastmasters for about six months since our inception. So. Right. Six, six months? Not too long. Okay, well, well, nice that you're here. But here's my question for you. How often are you in traffic court? <laughs> You know, it's funny, the, the whole idea for this speech actually came about as I was driving from Colorado to Chicago on a one-day stint, and me and my buddy were playing How Much Time Can We Shave Off the Siri Projection, uh, which, which landed me a 90 mile an hour speeding ticket. So. <laughs> we'll keep that between us. <laughs> well, John, we, we're, did you drive down here, by the way? I'm sorry? Did you drive down here? No, 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 I won't. <laughs> You'll be okay getting home. <laughs> Thank you for participating tonight in certificate, and even drivers like you get a bag. Thank you. Ken, 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 what club are you with, and for how long? I'm with Vintage Toastmasters, and we've been, uh, I started with them and we've been around for seven years. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, I know HR is probably waiting for you when you get back to work. <laughs> so we won't talk about anything with HR. But you had a particular challenge because you originally had a PowerPoint presentation. What was your thought process? We want to know as poster. <coughs> what was your thought process as you were preparing knowing you were going to be at that slight disadvantage. Share your secret. Panic. I just panicked. <laughs> <laughs> like, I haven't got a chance. These guys are so good. I really, I really appreciate what I really like about everything. The quality of the speeches, the uh, intimacy, the back and forth between the speakers and the audience and everything. And it, even though, you know, when, when I came, 
my club always thinks they're so great and everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, wow, you know, we're, we're this, that, and the other. We can do this. You know, they see some contests. You might have seen the contest at a certain level, but then when you step up to the next one, it's really something. Um, I was just determined to try, to try to work around it and see what I could fill in. Didn't quite go like I wanted, but, you know, that's like, yeah. Well, you're definitely an example of how to adjust under contest conditions on what to do. So, you will too get a participation certificate. And yes, you guessed it. Despite. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sit down. <laughs> and Luke Trust Masters. We meet at noon on Tuesdays at the Northern Trust Building of Madison and Webbs. When I saw your title, Chicken, I actually thought you were going to talk about me because I consider myself a chicken. But you've taken chicken to a different level. <laughs> <laughs> the barriers you broke down. The dark and white moon. It touched me. And here's what I want to know. On one of your bios, you, you, you mentioned about uh, Toastmaster leaders have inspired you. Was I one of those leaders? I was just kidding. Man. Why the humorous contest? You seem so reserved. Why humor? I don't know. I have a speech prepared, and the opportunity was there, so I, I took it. This is actually my first contest. Woo! So you thought you would not get it yet, because I have to really get you about the chicken, the way you did the chicken and the lamb thing. But, but you chose to talk about food in a humorous contest as to something else. You just did? Or was there any inspiration? Did you dream about a chicken the night before? <laughs> what can I say, Cynthia? I love chicken. <laughs> well, that's to the point. And so you deserve to finally get this and me not give you a hard time. Chicken now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I thought I timed her pretty well, but they are still counting the ballots. So at this time, I'm going to. Oh, wait a minute. Tim is mouthing to me, and I gave up lip reading. So, Tim, did you have an announcement to make? Just that all these proceedings are going to be videotaped, and uh, for you contestants, I'll be emailing the area governor the links. All the contests will be made public after the last division contest this coming Sunday. So look for my YouTube account and other places for all eight contests to be up and running. The site is timsvideo.com, and uh, there's an archive of over four years there. Okay, thank you, Tim. And, and folks, check it out. It's some pretty good speeches that are out there. I see Don out here. Don, do you have any announcements for the district you would like to share while we're waiting? Oh, I see Pam's hand up as well. Why don't we clap while she comes up? <laughs>
it's on behalf it of us. It doesn't have my name. I, I know, but it's in the It does say ATTEs. There we go. All right, so, thank you. And I want to say thank you for letting us use this space. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we love thank you. you. We love you. Announcements on the floor. Is that the other yes. I just want to say, stage time, stage time, stage time. <laughs> Clubs, you can go and register for the con for the fall conference. It's ninety nine dollars until October thirty first. So please get your early registrations in, and you will save money. And that includes all your friends, relatives, guests. At ninety-nine dollars and comes all that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and I believe we are ready now. No, we're not. Okay, I had the wrong now. That's okay. But you know what? I, I see our Central North Division Governor coming up, so she's about to take the mic from me. So I'll let her talk. <laughs> You guys are waiting to see who won the evaluation contest and the humorous speech contest tonight. Unfortunately, I don't have the winners <laughs> yet. I know, I know, you thought I was coming up to tell you I had the winners, but I didn't come up to tell you that. I came up to talk to you about the one thing that goes on this time of year. Does anybody know what goes on during contest season? <laughs> Let's work with something postmasters related that goes on during contest season. Who can guess? Dudes. Hello, dudes. Let's talk about the dudes here. I'm glad somebody was able to say that. I didn't have to actually give the answer. It is dues time, and we really want to make sure that everybody not only pays dues for themselves, but also encourages everyone else in their club to continue with Toastmasters. This is a great organization, and we know that a lot of people really enjoy the contest. They enjoy getting up and practicing speaking and becoming better leaders and communicators. And we love giving them opportunities to do so. And you can't do so if you are not a member of the club. Dues is the main thing that you have to pay in order to maintain your membership. I do believe I might be about to get my winners. Ooh, your winners! Your winners! <laughs>
We're going to start with third place. Sorry. We're going to start with the evaluation contest. Oh, no. Oh, we're, 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 we're not going to hold 
all of you guys here. We know it's late. We know you're ready to go. We've got one. I'll freeze it, frame it from the video. Oh, beautiful. There we go, right there then. Right. Thanks, Sandy. Okay, in that case, at this time, now that we've done everything, is anybody forgetting anything? Adjourn. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting, uh, contest adjourn. Thank you. Yeah.